Today I'm going to show you some of the fascinating optical properties of some lanthanide salts. This video is a spin-off of another video I've spent ages working on trying to make every possible alum, and while none of the lanthanides worked as alums, they still ended up being incredibly interesting to work with in their own way. With that I began by transferring small samples of terbium, praseodymium, neodymium, erbium, holmium, and europium to six different beakers. These samples are all from my element collection, but I decided to sacrifice them for this project as most of them were improperly stored and had begun to oxidize over time. To each of these samples I first added some water followed by concentrated sulfuric acid in order to dissolve them into their sulfates. Europium was so reactive that it didn't even need acid to begin to dissolve, and when it did dissolve it formed a clear solution along with terbium. Praseodymium formed a bright neon green solution as it dissolved, while neodymium formed a purple solution. Erbium formed a somewhat pink, and holmium was a dirty yellowish brown color. Now at first, everything seemed to be going perfectly with each of these metals dissolving far more cleanly than I expected. However, as usual, I very quickly started running into problems. The first problem I ran into is that the europium sulfate that formed was nearly completely insoluble, when on paper it should be at least reasonably soluble in water. As it turns out, this is because europium forms europium-2 sulfate upon dissolution in sulfuric acid, which is isostructural with barium sulfate and therefore completely insoluble. This was pretty easy to fix though by the addition of some hydrogen peroxide which readily formed the much more soluble europium-3 sulfate. As for the rest of the samples, the biggest problem I ran into was the sudden realization that each one of these salts exhibited very clear and dramatic retrograde solubility. This is a property of a few different salts, most of which are sulfates, where solubility decreases as temperature increases. This obviously makes crystallization a headache, but it also made dissolving the metals in the first place pretty annoying. Basically what began to happen is that as the metals dissolved and the concentration of their sulfates increased in solution, the piece of metal itself became completely encased in its sulfate and unable to further react. This was a very difficult thing to work with as the dissolution of metal in acid is quite exothermic. But at the same time, trying to cool these reaction mixtures down to prevent their crystallization only slowed the reaction to a crawl. Over the course of a few days, I finally worked through these problems, and during that time, I began to notice something strange as I was carrying the beakers back and forth from my fume hood to my workbench. At first, I thought I was finally losing my mind, and it looked like holmium in particular seemed to change color depending on the type of light it was under. Eventually I did some testing and found that holmium appeared yellow under full spectrum LED light, but somehow red under fluorescent light. I went ahead and tested this on all the lanthanide salts I made and found that the rest of the colored ones also exhibited this same property to different extents. The next most dramatic one was erbium, which was a sort of salmon color under full spectrum light, but a deep purple that looked very similar to holmium under fluorescent light. Neodymium seemed to lose most of its color under fluorescent lighting, but really only in solution, while crystalline neodymium sulfate was seemingly unaffected. Praseodymium sulfate seemed nearly unaffected, and maybe became a bit less vibrant under fluorescent light, but certainly didn't exhibit the dramatic changes of the other three. I then decided to test all the samples under 395 nanometer UV light, which was pretty unremarkable and resulted in no color change of any of the samples. However, under 365 nanometer UV light, the terbium and europium samples showed definite red and green fluorescence. This was somewhat muted with the europium sample as most of the red color came from the bit of europium sulfate that had crystallized out in the bottom. The terbium sample, however, exhibited strong green fluorescence in solution. As for why lanthanide salts are able to do this, it all comes down to their unique use of the f orbital. The f orbital is buried two levels below the principal valence orbital, meaning it's even deeper buried than the d orbital. In both cases, quantum mechanical calculations would tell us that electronic transitions are impossible in both cases. 
This is due to the nonpolar achiral tetrahedral complexes formed by transition metals and lanthanides, which have a very high degree of centrosymmetry. Conversely, tetrahedral transition metal complexes like tetramine copper or permanganate do not have centrosymmetry and are much more intensely colored as a result. However, the octahedral hydrates of copper and manganese do still have color, albeit a lot more faint, and that's because quantum mechanics doesn't tell us everything. More specifically, vibrational asymmetries which are not accounted for under Born-Oppenheimer approximations allow for very limited transitions between the d orbital and the f orbital. Since the f orbital is buried even deeper than the d orbital, these transitions are even more rare, and so the respective band gap is very narrow. As a result, lanthanide absorption wavelengths are very narrow, or sharper and therefore cleaner to the human eye. This is why the colors of lanthanide salts are so vivid, and it's also why they appear to be different colors depending on the light they're under. As a side note, this is also why certain transition metal salts and certain lanthanide salts are colorless, because their orbitals are either completely full or completely empty, and so transitions are literally impossible. Now at this point I was still filming this all for my alum video, and so for the next step I went ahead and measured out equal volumes of each lanthanide sulfate solution, transferring them all to new beakers, and one by one I tried making them into alums. This process essentially involved adding concentrated potassium hydroxide dropwise until the lanthanide had completely precipitated as its hydroxide. I would then slowly add more sulfuric acid dropwise until the hydroxide had redissolved, which would result in a slightly acidic solution containing potassium ions, lanthanide ions, and sulfate ions. This mixture ideally would slowly form crystals of a potassium lanthanum sulfate dodecahydrate in typical alum fashion. However, what actually happened was that terbium, praseodymium, neodymium, and europium all formed highly insoluble double salts that nearly immediately crashed out as a fine powder. These salts all being retrograde soluble couldn't be heated and then cooled to form larger crystals, and so the only option was to dissolve them all in a large excess of water and wait weeks for the water to slowly evaporate. These never did form alums though, and the issue isn't that the lanthanides didn't form double salts, the problem is that these double salts were not dodecahydrates and so they couldn't form the desired alum crystals. Erbium and holmium on the other hand didn't seem to form double salts at all, and simply formed hard salt layers as their solutions evaporated. I don't know if these two even form hydrates at all, and were both a nightmare to try to crystallize throughout the entire process. Now, even though the alum making side of this was a failure, I do think the fact that terbium, praseodymium, neodymium, and europium can all form highly insoluble double salts with potassium is a very useful thing to know and could be a very good way to maximize recovery of the particularly expensive europium and terbium salts. Now, at this point, I was a month in on something I expected to spend no more than a week working on and was ready to be done with these lanthanides for the time being. With that, I went ahead and allowed all the samples to crystallize as much as they could through evaporation and then collected each one by vacuum filtration. Here I have the final samples of the potassium double salts of terbium and europium, which both show intense fluorescence under 365 nanometer UV light. Given the fact that the praseodymium and neodymium double salts are dramatically less vibrant than their pure sulfate counterparts, these two might be even more strongly fluorescent in a pure sulfate form, which I'll have to try out at some point. As far as the rest of the lanthanide sulfates go, they all exhibit the same optical properties as dry crystals that they did in solution, which I had a lot of fun messing around with. With that, the rest of the video at this point is just footage I got showing off the different samples under different types of light, which you can feel free to keep watching. On that note, I'll go ahead and close and say that I hope you found this video interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my incredible patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. And to everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.